Good afternoon. In the early 50s, Walter Cronkite she was our premier news person. The show called You Are There. And I'd like us all to just pause and remember Red Hook as it was in that fateful, pivotal year of 1863. Thanks to the Rhinebeck Historical Society and the Avery Benson Historical Society of Red Hook, a group of us, including President Lincoln, this gentleman from Germantown is armed to the teeth, so don't get out of line. <laughs> David Miller, the president, putting close the president of the Red Hook Society and I, James Elmendorf, captain in the United States Navy, circa whenever. Um, we just wanted to set the stage for you because this is a very important time in our history, 150 years after this most divisive experience in our civic life and it abides today as we know. We were a nation of 31 million people. Four million of us were enslaved. New York was the largest slaveholding state north of Maryland north of the Mason-Dixon line. The Hudson Valley, as you might recall, if we've done a little history, as we have dabbled in it, was built largely on the backs of enslaved human beings who were brought early on to this country, and our descendants, their descendants, thank God, are with us today in multitudes, and we are much, much richer for it, but we still have this abiding issue. Life in Red Hook and Rhinebeck, what were we then? Outside, it was indeed the post road, the Albany post road. It got a little better since the late 18th century when the trip from New York to Albany and back, depending on the season, took four days. And you could stay here at the Elmendorf Inn. And if you were a resident of Rhinebeck and Red Hook, you came here actually in 1803. We were only Rhinebeck. We split in 1812 and 1813. But we were a farming community. And we were gathered here in the great room to hear matters of import. And that's what we're about today. And just to set the stage, we have a marvelous friend and neighbor who is a native Red Oak, whose family came together here in Red Oak. And in a series of letters, just set the stage for us about what was happening at Red Oak in 1860, just prior to that extraordinary election. I just want to read briefly from that. Lincoln had lost the contest for a Senate seat, if you recall, <coughs> the vote took place in the state legislature, but the debate with Douglas, right, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, brought him to national attention and set him on course to become the Republican presidential candidate in 1860. It was a defining moment in American political history. Across America, in cities, towns, and villages, grassroots paramilitary organizations known as the Wide Awakes sprang up to build enthusiasm for electing Lincoln president. Young men in uniform marched at night with torches and colorful banners in Red Hook and the other, 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 other Hudson Valley towns, of course, lying back. Uh, before and after the election, there were speeches, fireworks, and parades. Thousands of people gathered to support their candidates and celebrate election victory in a four-way presidential race that reflected the growing rift between North and South. In 1860, Mary Jane Elmendorf was a Red Hook schoolgirl attending McClellan's uh, Collegiate Institute in Poughkeepsie. Her uncle Thomas and her father, Cornelius Elmendorf, wrote to her regularly, etc., etc. I take my pen in hand, dear Molly, on this 1st of October in 1860, just to, etc. And goes on, and then dear Molly, a little bit later, in November 7th of 1860, he writes to Molly, from Upper Red Hook, where he lived, to her in Poughkeepsie. Uh, uh, the uh, little giants of Rhinebeck came into the village with blazing torches and a constant discharge of fireworks in their hands as they marched. The sight was grand, such as I presume Red Hook has never before seen. It cast the great cable celebration. You recall the Atlantic cable had been laid in 1857, I believe, by the Great Eastern. So we're beginning to be connected instantaneously worldwide with the news. The sight was grand, such as I presume Red Hook has ever before seen. It cast the great cable celebration completely in the shade. It had a great success as a meeting. About 3,000 persons were out. 
in a town, town-wide, of about 3,500, 4,000 people, and same in Rheindeck. That was a lot of folks to gather. Uh, and after all, we could be Democrats will have to take an excursion up Salt River. Salt River is an expression in that day that meant, you know, <coughs> in, in, in a farming vernacular, you would be on the hind teat. So, hurrah for Link Turn, as the loafers sang out yesterday. Old Abe will be president if he lives. And then we move forward to later, November 19th in Red Hook. Molly dear, yours of the 10th was received on the following Wednesday, a very speedy passage, only four days from Poughkeepsie to Red Hook, et cetera, et cetera. And then she's, he says, and as Noah provided for the flood in order to save his family, so the Democratic Party has been striving for the safety of this great union. And here comes the question. Who is responsible for the great flood of indignation that, arisen, that has arisen in the South? Who has caused the troubling of the waters? So what a tide is flowing that may dissolve the Union. What has caused feelings of bitterness, having a tendency to secession among our Southern brethren? Have not the sentiments that have issued from the Republican presses and claims <coughs> even from the public by Republican occupants caused all this? I think they have. The present state of affairs truly is sad, because I hope that the sober second thought will prevail and that all will be well. Cut to a little postscript. Tom Selvendorf's hopeful, hopeful phrase that all will be well anticipates a line from Lincoln's farewell address to the people of Springfield at the train station February 11, 1861, as he departed for Washington. Let us confidently hope that all yet will be well. Uncle Thomas had a letter from, well, Willie. What is to come from all of this province can alone but tell, we hope for the best. And people began to enlist. And lots of people, lots of young men from Red Oak and Rhinebeck got together. Uh, Edwin Curtis was typical of them. His story is there uh, in, in just a bit to give you an idea of who they were. The average Union soldier was five feet eight and a quarter inches tall and he weighed about 150 some odd pounds. He went into battle, would you mind standing up? He's not five eight and he weighs a little bit more than 150 but he had a musket, an 1862 Springfield musket that weighed nine point some odd pounds. He carried a backpack which weighed another however many pounds. 25. 25 pounds, and he went off to war dressed like that. He went south into Virginia and beyond in woolens and leathers, and it was hot. So we know what a burden the war was. But Edwin Curtis was enthusiastic. We drove five hours a day. We went bathing today in the Atlantic just before dinner and had a fine time. Caught a great many clams. The regiment is filling up fast. I wish I could get one from Red Hook, etc. And he goes on to say. And he, uh, he was there at the beginning uh, and went on later down south and ended up in later in his life, he survived the Civil War. He ended up as a uh, an Indian fighter in the uh, in the West. But now I return the podium and the history to David Miller and Elizabeth Clark. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is the accounts of battle that we we actually received a lot of these letters. They were published in the Rhinebeck Gazette. Rhinebeck was desperate for news of the war front. So they would actually publish these letters without the permission of the soldiers, and soldiers would actually find out by surprise when they received the Rambic Gazette that they had their letters published. Um, the first letter comes to us from Stephen A. McCarty. He is a relative, he's the grandson of Stephen A. McCarty from Rhinebeck. Uh, he was in the Navy. He writes from the Mississippi after a battle near, near Louisiana. Dear brother, undoubtedly you have heard something of the bombardments of Fort Jackson and St. Philip. The, bomb the bombardment commenced early on the morning of the 18th of April. In the morning we went ahead and took three schooners in tow to place them in position. They were there anchored behind a point so that they could not be seen by the occupants of the fort. 
Thus they could fire their mortars by ranges given them by the surveyors. When we dropped the schooners at anchor behind the point, we had to shoot ahead to turn around. As we did so, we came into plain view of Fort Jackson when they immediately opened fire on us. We returned the fire until a rebel steamer came out from the fort. When we, fire, when we fired on her, the shot took effect in her machinery and drove her back. Thus it happened that we fired the first shot in the action. Soon the schooners opened with their mortars and continued firing until dark. When we had one schooner sunk, one man killed, and several wounded. The sky was illumined by the constant discharge of the guns. It was the most grand and awful sight I ever saw or ever expect to see again. It was like one continuous roar of thunder, only much louder, and continuous flashing of lightning, only steadier and much brighter. We were, th were, we were within 600 yards of the fort, and the balls whirled over and around our heads, thick and fast, making noise enough to wake the dead. The sight was beautiful to behold, yet dreadful to think of. He also tells another story about traveling across during this battle, carrying ammunition. And at any point, if, a, if he had been shot with a mortar, it would have, the whole boat would have gone up. So he, you know, he's hauling this, and he's doing all this, and it's a really dangerous thing, and they're on the water. The next letter I have comes from, a, from the Ellsworth Regiment, after one of their major battles at Hanover Courthouse. Now, the, the Ellsworth, or the 44th New York, were one of the first to enlist. And they actually did go to the Battle of Gettysburg. But this is early on. This is from May 1862. Dear Father, I received a letter from you last week while on guard duty near Yorktown. Yesterday morning, about 7 o'clock, we left Gaines Mills and marched near this place, where we were on picket duty about two hours, and then received orders to join our brigade, which was about four miles in the rear. We had got about halfway when we got into a brisk skirmish with the enemy and had a warm time for about two hours. We were then reinforced and made the rebels run. When in the fight, I did not think of being shot. I felt that he who hath made heaven and earth will not suffer thy foot to be removed, and he that keepeth thee will not sleep. Jim and I came out all safe and sound, and the only sign I show of having been in a battle is a bullet hole in one of my shoulder straps and a dirty looking musket. The boys are now cheering General McClellan, who is riding by. Your affectionate son, Isaac. P.S. Our flag had 48 bullet holes in it and one through the flag staff. So this is from Isaac Russell. And we have, um, a, the picture was actually taken of this flag. It became such a symbol for them. Next letter is from Isaac's brother James, or Jim, as he says. Dear Father, I received your letter yesterday afternoon and had hardly read it when we had orders to catch up with our brigade, which was engaged in a fight with the enemy. Our regiment soon came up. Came up. The fight lasted about two hours. Isaac and myself were uninjured. Two of our company were killed, nine wounded, and seven or eight missing. Our lieutenant colonel is a very brave man and is much liked by the boys. Isaac had a narrow escape and the bullet came, bullets came as near to me was, as was comfortable. We are resting today. Our loss in the 44th is about 123, killed, wounded, or missing. The rebel loss was very heavy. This morning, in walking over the battlefield, I saw large numbers of the slain enemy. We made this rebel skedaddle, and that was what we meant to do. They were badly whipped. Our company is very small, and the boys feel very sad. We have lost some of our best men. Very few showed the white feather, and you need not be ashamed of your boys. I think they did their duty and did not flinch. I cannot give you all the details now, as we are nearly worn out with marching and fighting. Samuel Risley and Charles Luff are both uninjured. Yours affectionately, James. So he not only is reporting back on his brother and himself, but Samuel Risley and Charles Luff are fellow Rhymed boys from the 44th. I'm going to turn it over to David. I just have a couple of more excerpts. This is from James River, Virginia. <coughs> Uh, the headquarters of the first New Jersey volunteers. Dear Father, I am alive and as well as can be expected under the <coughs> circumstances. As accounts of the late battles, of course, have been published, I suppose you've all been anxious to hear from me. But for over a week, we have not permitted to send any letters. And the few lines I sent to you on the 28th were all I was able to write, and I doubt whether they even reached you. When we entered the woods where the fight was going on, the bullets flew thick and fast, but the Jersey boys did not flinch under this, their first fire. I say first fire 
in comparison with this because the West Point was a sham fight. I guess they had practice up at West Point before they left for the South. I had a narrow escape from death. A bullet struck the stock of my rifle, completely shattering it, and for a moment entirely numbed my arm. But the rifle, but for the rifle, the bullet would have penetrated my body just above my hip. A very small splinter stuck in my hand, drawing blood. This was the only wound received by me. Our principal trouble has been want of food, as we have been lived on mostly crackers and coffee without any meat. Never before have I found coffee so strengthening, and without it, we could not have endured the fatigue. We're now resting at a very pleasant camp, but how long we should be, shall be allowed to rest here and remain quiet, I cannot tell. I hope for a week at least, because the whole army is really in want of rest. Mm -hmm. Affectionately, your son, Frank. And the last excerpt I have is from the 128th Regiment of the New York Volunteers. It's from Alexandria, Louisiana, April 27, 1864. That's about 100 miles north of New Orleans. When we read so much about the war, we read about uh, Virginia, Pennsylvania, going up and down. But this war was nationwide, as far as our nation existed at the time. There were battles in Louisiana, in Texas, up and down the Mississippi. There were many armies fighting battles on many fronts for the entire four years of the war. So <clears throat> this is a letter uh, back to the Gazette. And a lot of officers especially liked to write, and they would write letters to the Gazette as if they were war correspondents, in spite of the fact they were actually fighting in the war. So this is one of them. It's from a uh, Lieutenant Commander Fred Frederick Wilkinson. Correspondence to the Amenia Times, Alexandria, Louisiana. We arrived back again at our camp the night before last, having retreated 82 miles in four days with the Rebs at both our front and rear. <coughs> we have marched over 20 miles per day for the last four days, besides fighting the enemy and driving him from the position in front of us. When we arrived at the Cane River, the Rebs held the position we wished to cross at. Our division was in the advance. We were ordered to cross the river, which we did, wading it like the good soldiers we are, with the water nearly to our armpits. The 128th Regiment was the first to cross. Rapid firing soon took place, and the battle line was formed. Soon came the order to charge, and the enemy was flanked and driven from his position. The 128th planted their flag on top of the hill and have received much praise. Our officers showed great courage. Some dozen men had been wounded. A few of them since had died. I was talking to Chris before, and you have to remember that twice as many men died from disease, actually were shot and killed during the battles. There was no penicillin, there was no hygiene, and if you got sick, if you scratched yourself on something, you would get gangrene and probably pass out, pass away. Um, and the last thing he says is, the cause of our retreat was a sudden and unexpected fall of the Red River, which prevented boats from reaching us with our supplies, and that's why they had to retreat. So, thank you. Fighting and dying was a family affair. <clears throat> the nation was at war, as David said. There were many battles and many fronts, and many armies, small to great size. Uh, among the families divided were the Losies of Upper Red Hook, Harvey Losey and his brother John. Harvey happened to go to school in Louisiana, in New Orleans, met and married a Southern Belle, and <coughs> chose to fight on the, on the, south, uh, on the south side as Confederate. And, uh, and his brother did not go into the Army, but was a doctor and became a very famous local doctor here. We will have a postscript later. But it was a family affair that came home, and it came home here to Red Hook in the uh, form of Warren Chamberlain. In 1841, William Chamberlain and his father built Maysland, which those of you in Red Hook know, it's the big red brick house next to the what is now the Linden Avenue Middle School but was in the Red Oak Central School for everybody in, in, uh, when it was built in 1939 and then later. Um, Warren Chamberlain, his third child, who had been born in 1835, was appointed to West Point, class of 1860, but failed to graduate due to deficiency in mathematics. Raise your hand. <laughs> At the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861, he had run a commission as first lieutenant in the 12th New York Infantry, a New York State Militia Regiment that sailed for Washington, D.C. just a week after the fall of Fort Sumter. In a letter to their sister Mary, dated April 22, 1861, his brother William describes the moment. 
Warren left in the Baltic last evening in excellent health and spirits, the coolest man in the regiment. Three months later, Warren had transferred to the 14th Infantry, a regular army uh, regiment. And on the 30th of August of 1862, he was on staff duty as an aide to General George Sykes, commanding the 2nd Division in General Porter's Army Corps at the 2nd Battle of Bull Run, 2nd Manassas, if you will, where he was mortally wounded and died that night behind enemy lines. On December 8, 1862, his father, William, received word in a letter dated November 25th from one of Warren's West Point classmates, a Confederate officer and Virginian named Frank Huger. I hope that mine is not the painful task to inform you that Warren was certainly killed in the engagement of August 30th. Major Taylor of General Lee's staff told me he saw Warren mortally wounded <coughs> and endeavored to make him as comfortable as possible and before leaving placed him in charge of one of your surgeons. A short time later he died and before, a short time before he died he gave to a Texas soldier a letter he had written the day previously to his brother William Chamberlain, requesting him to write a few last lines, that's requesting the Texan to write a few last lines on his last letter, which he dictated, simply saying he was severely wounded and sending a farewell to you all. The old Texan promised him to send the letter, which I have no doubt he has done. I beg to offer to your father, sister, and my himself my warmest sympathy in your distress. Not all the horrors of the sanguinary conflict could alienate the personal affection and esteem I entertained for your brother, and I mourn with you all that is out of my power ever to be of any service to him. Warren's last dictated words to the Texan in pencil. The Texan wrote, My darling brother, I am dying. 30 August. God bless you. And now we turn to the great task remaining. So, in 1862, a lot of the regiments were done. Their 100 days of service was up, they were free to leave. Um, this is not the case for everyone, but an appeal was going out to start a new regiment in Dutchess County. And this was prior to the draft. So there was no conscription. This was voluntary at this point. So an appeal went out, and this is the appeal that they sent out. At a meeting of the Executive Committee of Dutchess County to promote enlistments for the new regiment to be raised in this senatorial district, district held on Tuesday, the 29th of July in Poughkeepsie, Benson J. Lossing, George W. Sterling, and James H. Weeks, H. Weeks were appointed to make an appeal to the inhabitants of Dutchess. They have done so in the few words that follow knowing full well that a hint is quite insufficient for an intelligent and patriotic people. Men of Dutchess County, our country calls upon us for immediate and effective aid. Your strong arms and unquestioned courage, men of Dutchess, stimulated by your patriotism, are needed at this moment in the great work of smiting treason to the earth and crushing rebellion in the dust. Give them instantly to the public service, and before the autumn frost shall appear, the rebel capital and the rebel army may be ours. And through your instrumentality, cooperating with the brave men already in the field, the blessings of peace and the joys of prosperity will be restored to our now distracted country. Your names will then be inscribed on the records of patriotism with those of the heroes of the revolution. They as the liber liberators, you as the saviors of your country. Like them, you will deserve and obtain the love of contemporaries and the homage of posterity. Men of Duchess, we know that the consciousness of having saved your country from ruin would be, in your estimation, a sufficient reward for your services. But the national government, and that of your own state, always mindful of those who serve them well, have cho chosen to offer the most generous pecuniary rewards, the largest ever offered by, the gov by any government, in the form of bounty bounties, exclusive of regular pay and rations. So they are bribing them, in a sense. They can't make them at this point. But that's not quite enough. Women of Duchess, your influence in any cause is potential. We ask you to lend that power to your country in this hour of its need. Say to your sons, brothers, lovers, hus husbands, if need be, in the spirit of the Spartan matron, go forth to the defense of your country and come back with your shield or upon it. Go forth to the defense of your country and save it from ruin or gloriously die in attempt. 
for they never fall who die in a great cause. Benson J. Lawson. And they actually published a number for each town that was required to contribute. And Redwick was asked to contribute 35 men. Rhinebeck was asked to contribute 30. Just to give you a feel for what they were paying them, a soldier's pay, a private enlisting under the new law called for volunteers if the war should close within 12 months, would receive besides his regular rations and clothing the following amounts of money. State bounty, $50. Government advance bounty, $27. One month advance pay, $13. Pay per year, $156. Government bounty at the end of the war, $75. The total was $312. Rations, they gave you $9 per month. I guess you had to buy your own food from where you could get it from. Um, so that's $108. Clothing, about $20 a year. For total one year's pay of $440. That was a lot of money in uh, the 1860s. Now, I guess not all soldiers uh, came to a, a Good and even at home, because on, on September 13, 1862, there was a little brief article, Suicide of a Soldier. Augustus Adam committed suicide by hanging himself on Saturday afternoon, the 27th, in the stable of James Winecoop, Esquire, about a mile and a half from the village of Rhinebeck. He was discovered about 3 o'clock of that day when his body was quite cold. He is said not to have broken any bones of his neck, but died of strangulation. So he did not do a, a, a good job of... Uh, of doing this. The deceased was a native of Germany and enlisted the 128th Regiment about six weeks since, but was transferred to the 150th Regiment. He was very intemperate in his habits, and this is probably the cause of his committing suicide. Mm -hmm. I can't comment on that. <laughs> it, was, it was awful. But it was that time and and a man named Peter Funk uh, joined the war enthusiastic he was in the uh, the corporal in the 150th New York Volunteers Company F which was mainly Red Hook Rhinebeck boys and just to give you a flavor again when this war broke out I was taken with the notion to enlist and being naturally self-willed I did and was sent to Poughkeepsie the rendezvous for the 150th Regiment. I was assigned to Company F in command of John L. Green of Rhinebeck. There were four sergeants and eight corporals appointed, and no horrors, I was among the latter. That's in August of 1862. In October 1862, about four o'clock in the afternoon, we started for the river where the steamer Oregon was to carry us to New Jersey. This is at Poughkeepsie. Mothers, wives, fathers, and brothers calling the names of some loved ones in the ranks. The scene was heartbreaking. At daybreak on October 12th, we landed at Jersey City. We were put on cars, and away we went, and away went the iron horse, and the state of New York soon far behind. And he goes on and on, and he gets a taste of what it's like, and it's rough, as I said, and as David pointed out. Here he is in camp. And in the 16th of uh, the moment, it was a court-martial held, and Albert Jones of the 145th New York Volunteers was sentenced to be shot for desertion on the 21st. A bit of a delay, but on October 16th, 1863, the execution of Albert Jones, 145th New York Volunteers, took place. This is Funk writing in the Red Oak Advertiser, a long diary, which is fascinating, page to page, an old man writing about his experience in the war. Uh, <clears throat> it took place, and I shall never forget. The sun came out bright and warm, shedding its brightest rays. At half past one, our division, the first, was marched out into an open field and formed into three sides of a hollow square, the grave being at one end. At 2 p.m., the procession came in sight. In front marched the brigade band playing the death march. Next came 12 riflemen with the bayonets fixed. Next came the prisoner walking by the side of the chaplain and surgeon of the regiment. Next came four men burying his coffin, and then four riflemen bringing up the rear and forming one of the saddest processions I ever saw. 
The prisoner's step was undaunted, walking with his head up, looking around upon the ranks as he marched down to the grave. The coffin was set over the grave. He was then placed in the coffin. His eyes were bandaged, his sentence read, and at a given command, signal four rifles belched forth their contents, and his soul was launched into eternity. We were then marched on each side of the coffin to look at the corpse as he lay with his breast exposed, showing the four holes made by the rifle balls. We then marched back to camp. This was the first man shot for desertion in our division. Up close and personal and family. And then we oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to do that page later. 1863. We're now in 1863. And over here, afterwards, you'll see a copy of that first salvo of did we have? We have more stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I apologize. I thought I was calling you. <coughs> Pardon me. No, we were doing a little trading back and forth. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. A couple of more things. So oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. 120 May 1963. Right. All right. We have another letter from 128th Regiment in 1863, the faith, faithful year. Um, this is from Cap uh, no, at this point he's a major, Major Frank Keyes. He was writing earlier, Frank. He's now the captain of the company. The weather is splendid at Jefferson City, and fresh vegetables, strawberries, and, and etc. are plenty. The boys like it very much at this place, and those who are sick are rapidly recovering. Corporal Bowman, Peter Scally, David Farrow, Albert Cole, and Jonathan Van Etten are in the hospital at this place, though none are dangerously sick. Braley and Delamater have returned to duty. Finger, Leiden, Coop, and Coward are in the regimental hospital. A few words in relation to forwarding the bodies of such as died here may be acceptable. So he's, people are requesting to have bodies in the case of deceased sent home, and he wants to explain why it's a difficult process. From the nature of the climate and soil where the graves are dug, decomposition takes place very quickly. To send a body north, it must first be embalmed and then placed in a metallic coffin. The total expense, including freight, is $125, the whole of which must be paid in advance. Most of the time, officers have not that amount in their possession, and of course the deceased have not, nor is there anyone on whom to draw. As even on a northern bank, a draft is subject to heavy discount, so that either the money must be in the possession of the soldier or deposited with some trustworthy person in the regiment or city to be used in case of need. Either method is, of course, attended with risk. It will be seen by this that it will be impossible for me to comply with requests which have been sent for bodies to be sent home in case of disease. And then he writes again in August. From Donald, Donaldsonville, Louisiana, July 23rd, so after Gettysburg. And they're not anywhere near Gettysburg. The rebels have all retreated from this place and are now back towards Thibodeau and Brashear. What will be our next move, I cannot say. We are now bivouacked in an open field only a few tents being on hand, of which I am a happy, which I'm happy to say I have one. Lieutenant Davis went to New Orleans last night to enter a hospital there, his health being failed. Lieutenant Colonel Foster and Captain Gifford are both sick in New Orleans, having Colonel, leaving Colonel Smith alone in command. And on account of the sick scarcity of officers, I am on duty with my own company. The weather is very hot, and we have a shower every day. Being very near the river, we bathe frequently and find it very conducive to health. We expect the paymaster today or tomorrow, and I suppose we will receive four months' pay. Not much can be purchased in this town, as it was partially burned by the fleet last year, and still more injured three weeks ago. Most of the men who were in Jefferson came up yesterday, and I enclose a list of sick and absent men of the company. We are anxious to know how the people of Rambit felt when they heard of the fall of Port Hudson. As the stormers, we were not used. We need not expect our medals or promise promotion. It was a, an article in the paper, May 31st, 1864. <coughs> a soldier's claims. All soldiers serving two years and honorably discharged are entitled to a $100 bounty. Nine months volunteers, $25 bounty. All soldiers and seamen wounded and otherwise disabled are entitled to a pension. If the soldier or sailor be killed, the following persons are entitled to his bounty or his back pay. 
First, his widow. Second, if he left no widow, his children. Third, if he has no widow or children, his father and mother. And fourth, if he has none of them, then it's the brothers and sisters. So they gave the God. Who would get this? There's a lot of money in those days. You want to see it you know, not so well to the people. We're entitled to it. There's an article, March 15, 1864, the Pocahontas Engine Company, number two of this village. Rhinebeck still has the Pocahontas yeah. pumper in the back of the firehouse. Since the commencement of this war furnished 22 men to Uncle Sam, the company was organized June 13, 1859, and has enjoyed a career of unexampled prosperity. And the following is a list of and the time they were uh, asked to serve. And it lists all the famous families of, of Rhinebeck, Marquardt, uh, Tremper, Riker, Van Damme, <coughs> Kip, and at least several of them were killed during the war. So that was an interesting thing. Do you want to skip the, uh, yeah, okay. I, I, one more, a letter, an anonymous letter. Now at the end of the war, um, I was doing some research the last couple of days, like how long did we stay in the South? I mean, there was reconstruction that took place. We still have troops in Germany, in Japan, and in Korea. So how long would we say in the South? And apparently it took about 12 years until 1877 for the final troops to be pulled out. And slowly over those 12 years, <coughs> one state after another was admitted. They re-elected senators and Congress and they sent them to Washington as the country rebuilt. But here is a letter written anonymously to the Rhinebeck Gazette, signed a soldier. And it was written July 31st, 1865, which is almost four months after the war ended. And it's from Richmond, Virginia, the capital. They're still there. Dear Sir, be so kind as to publish this in the Gazette. It will show the treatment of non-commissioned officers and privates of the 20th Regiment, New York State Militia, received at the hands of the officers belonging to this regiment. In the first place, I must inform you of the fact that we haven't been paid since December 31st, last, and have been living on food that barely sustains life, and is the cause, we believe, of a great deal of sickness and a great many deaths which might be avoided if we had the right kind of food, or at least some vegetables and rice occasionally. We're doing a great deal of unnecessary duty. We are guarding houses of ill fame that are kept for the officers. Under, <laughs> under these circumstances, any wonder we all want to go home. When we found out that it's a combination on the part of the officers to keep the regiment here as long as they can to gratify their own selfish motives. I think you will agree with me when I explain the whole matter. It goes on a giant letter talking about this. But clearly, they were upset to have not gone home four months after the war ended. <laughs> Prisons and prisoners. Yeah. Yeah. Please do. So there, we've talked a couple times. If you weren't sent home, hadn't gotten sick, you might get captured. So the following letters we have are accounts of either guarding prisoners or prisoners themselves. This comes from us to Camp Hoffman, Point Lookout, Maryland, July 6, 1864, from George A. Clark. And he says this is correspondence of, of the Gazette. Well, it makes sense. George A. Clark used to own the paper. He actually did this quite frequently. This is one letter among many. <coughs> Friend Knoxon, you are doubtless aware that Point Lookout is one of the principal depots for rebel prisoners of war. To guard, whom is the principal to guard? Whom is the this is not very white. To guard is the principal duty of the federal troops now here. The prisoners occupy an immense enclosure within which are erected tents, many of them the approved commodious Sibley pattern mess houses, etc. The prisoners are in general under what is termed middle age, a very large proportion under 21, and a strong, healthy looking, athletic set of fellows. They seem to enjoy themselves like maggots in a rich cheese. Large numbers were captured in the present campaign against Richmond, and I find conversations with them to be interesting and often edifying. They uniformly agree that the Confederacy is on its last legs, and tell, tell sorrowful tales of hunger and privations which they have undergone at one period or another. But such, such things are on occasions to be looked for among all armies, and in all countries, and constitute part of a soldier's vocation. The leisure time of the Johnnies is employed in the manufacture of fans, toothpicks, finger rings, and other ornaments of wood, bone, and gutta percha. One thing in particular is decidedly disagreeable to the taste of our deluded southern brethren. Among their custodians are a few hundred, or a few hundred of their brethren of the ebony stripe, and it is very repulsive to their sensibilities to be marched about in charge of a sable guard. A captain but a short time ago was under guard of a stalwart African who was formerly his slave. What changes are wrought by war? Thine always, George A. Clark. And then the letters, the, the next two letters that I'm going to read, the first is an account of a battle. 
from one soldier's perspective. A lot of people were captured in this battle. I then have another letter of one of the people who were captured. So coming from Cedar Creek, Virginia, October 26, 1864, from the 128th Regiment. Editor of the Rhymed Gazette, Sir, enclosed, please find a copy of our list of killed, wounded, and missing on the eventful and ever to be remembered 19th of October, 1864, Battle of Cedar Creek. Perhaps a short sketch of the operations of the day may prove interesting to your many readers who are interested in us as a regiment. On the morning of the 19th at 4 o'clock, we were standing at arms in line of battle, awaiting the final order to march to front on reconnaissance. Suddenly, our ears were treated with yells, coming from none other than Johnny's throats, on our left, the left being occupied by the 8th Army Corps. Volley succeeded volley, varied by the grand accompaniment of screaming shell and grape. They continued for about 10 minutes, when all the sounds of strife ceased as if by magic. Just as we were congratulating ourselves on the supposed repulse, bullets came flying into our works from the rear and flank. We were flanked and fell back about three miles, fighting at every step. Our loss was heavy, 21 pieces of artillery, as well as all camp and garrison equipage. Reformed near Middletown, and by the most determined efforts on the part of our brave Sheridan, drove back the enemy, completely routing them and capturing 59 pieces of artillery, 150 wagons, their ambulance train, and about six or 7,000 prisoners. The countless number of dead and wounded on the field attest the desperate character of the fight. Our day's work ended, we lay down, after dark, hungry, ragged, and to think of our comrades gone. The 128 to the number of 177 enlisted and five commissioned were on advance picket duty, and the majority of that number are undoubtedly prisoners subject to the tender mercies of Jeff Minions. Jeff's Minions. Captain Thomas N. Davis handled the regiment in a highly, satis highly satisfactory to us all. Respectfully, C.W. McCown, Adjutant 128th New York Volunteers. So this come, the next letter comes to us from Charles Weller, who is not from Rhinebeck or Red Hook. The Fishkill Standard is permitted to take the following extracts, extracts from a letter written by Charles, Sergeant Charles A. Weller, who was recently taken prisoner and paroled. It is to written to his parents at the landing. Camp Parole, Annapolis, October 19, 1864. We, the 128th Regiment, went into the fight about 12 o'clock noon. Our corps charged the rebels and drove them for some time. Then we got orders to halt, and when we were forming, they came on our right flank, and we got orders to fall back. The firing at this time was very heavy, and one of our companies sh shot George W. Swords. I was near him and stopped to give him a drink. He told me the boys were retreating, so I took my gun and started after them. But the rebels coming from the right came in ahead and cut off my retreat, so I had to surrender. The rebels took about 300 of us, and our, bo our boys took some 300 of them. When I was taken, the rebels took everything I had, except that little testament you gave me, and two likenesses. They even took my shoes, and then marched us 20 miles, and I was barefooted. The next day, they gave us a little flour and a piece of meat, and we went two days without anything. We marched from Winchester to Northeast Station, which is about 90 miles, and then took cars to Richmond. In Libby Prison, we got half a loaf of cornbread and a small piece of meat a day. That is the way we lived for 20 days. At the expiration of that time, I was paroled, and now at this camp, awaiting to my turn to be exchanged. So perhaps for my first letter, the rebels who were maggots in rich cheese were not really exaggerating their tales. They're stealing from the soldiers they captured. The last thing about prisoners is sort of a reversal. It's several letters written to Rhinebeck, Red Hook area from a rebel soldier. Henry Gordon, who was uh, <coughs> kept in Fort Delaware, Delaware Federal Prison. And the first, just a couple of experts, excerpts from each of the letters. Uh, this is three months after the Battle of Gettysburg, October 8, 1863. Miss Mary Gerard, respected friend, I have the misfortune at this time to be a prisoner. I was captured at the Battle of Gettysburg and have been kept in this place ever since. Oh, what a contrast between this place and home. You know how it is at Father's house. There, at least, I, I could get and eat. I could get enough to eat and to wear. I've been destitute of everything, and you are the only acquaintance or friend that I have in the North from whom I could exact a favor. This, of course, was a problem. You could not write to anybody in the South. There was no mail that was delivered from federal prisons to the rebel area. You could only write letters to the North. Um, 
I will ask you to send me your food cups of tobacco and a few postage stamps. You shall not lose anything by sending me the above articles. If peace is ever made, I will repay you four times the worth. Send the package to C. Henry Gordon, Company C, 15 South Carolina Regiment, Fort Delaware, Delaware. The next letter is six months later. He's still in prison. Dear cousin, this is the cousin Harriet, who was up in Red Hook, I believe. Um, you will learn from this that I am still a prisoner at Fort Delaware. I've written to you twice since the reception of your letter, but no answer. I must think I made a mistake with the address. The box came safe, for which I am much obliged. Dear cousin, if it's convenient for you to do so, I'd be glad if you could send me a few dollars in money. I need a few articles of clothing that I could purchase here if I had the money. If you see fit to grant me this small favor, I'd be much obliged. If you see Mrs. Gerard, tell her that I would write to her, but from now on, prisoners are only allowed to write to relatives, not to friends in the North. P.S. Please excuse the bad handwriting. The weather is so cold, I can scarcely hold my pen or write a legible hand. My health is good and has been ever since I first wrote to you. This is February 1864. He's still there. Cousin Harriet, which is Harriet Lewis, um, Yours of the 30th, containing $5,000 in money, has been duly received, for which you will please accept many thanks. Sorry to hear so much sickness in your family. I hope that all are well by this time. If you should hear from my parents, let me know immediately. I have made several attempts to send them through the lines, but I doubt if they reach them. Henry Gordon. Here is November, 1865. Now, we're, you know, it's going two years he's been in this prison. The war is over. He's still in this prison. Dear friend, I've been waiting for some time for reply to my last letter. And he goes on and on. If you could send me six or eight dollars, I would truly appreciate it. Um, if, there's, whatever gets, uh, if there's a future day coming when all the affairs can be straightened out, if this war ever ends. Um, there's another letter here written by A.N. A. Cunningham. It's from Cedar Swamp, South Carolina, in 1866, a year later. Dear Mrs. Lewis, which is Henry's cousin, I received your letter on yesterday, came in five days. I was much surprised as well as gratified to hear from you. Sorry your letter was so short, alas, dear friend. Everything has changed here. We were once free and happy. We are poor and downtrodden people. You can have no idea of the poverty and distress in some parts of this country. Fortunately, the Yankees never got in legs than 14 miles of us, but I had great many scares and oh, such hiding of things. Give my love to your mother and sisters, Mrs. Lewis. I expect you've heard that Private Henry Gordon died in prison. We all feel very grateful to you and mother for your kindness to him in prison. He wrote to his friends informing them of the kindness. They will repay you if they ever have it in their power. And he goes on for four more pages of anger at the North over the conditions that are happening in the South a year after the war. And uh, we looked it up, Sarah Hermans, who did some research for me on Mrs. Lewis and Mary Gerard in, in uh, Red Hook, uh, looked at the Civil War records, and he died of scurvy after being in prison for two years. Just an you know, apple a day, and mm -hmm. it's sad. That's it. Thank you. Pardon, it's, it's a long word. We're a little uh, fuddled, but um, 1863, again, opening on January 1st with the Emancipation Proclamation, which arrived here in Red Hook by the Red Hook Weekly Journal on the uh, 8th of January. And then on to, uh, on to that uh, extraordinary battle of Gettysburg, where Peter Funk, whom we met earlier, uh, was preparing to arrive. In uh, June of uh, 1863, he said everything was confusion. The rebels had crossed the Potomac. And on June 26, we get another part of him saying, we took up our line of march for Gettysburg. <coughs> on the 28th of June, I had given about I had gone, I'd given out about five miles from this place, which was Monoxy Bridge, on the way to Gettysburg. My feet so blistered I could not step without great pain. Got in camp about two hours after the rest of the regiment. We lay there two days until Hooker's train, this General Joseph Hooker, went past, and, and that's his baggage train, went past, and then we started bringing up the rear. On June 30th, 1863, at night we camped in a piece of woods. July 1st, 1863. And in the morning, took up in the line of march, passed through Frederick City, and stopped for dinner on the other side. July 2nd, 1863. In the morning, we went away as fast as we could walk. The distant booming of the cannon now reached our ears, which sounded nearer and nearer, and told plainly of the harvest of death 
uh, reaped on that never to be forgotten field of slaughter. 11 a.m. July 2nd, 1863, we reached the field of battle, but being very tired, were ordered to rest in the field of dry back of Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge. 1 p.m. July 2nd, 1863, there's Funk, his first taste of battle. We lay there about two hours when overcame a 12-pound shell, screeching all kinds of murder. We were soon in where the fighting was heaviest. Wounded men running in the rear, running to the rear would tell us we were being whipped. Others would say, give them hell, boys. If you don't, they'll give it to you. July 3rd, 1863. The next morning, we were in support of Battery M, 1st New York Artillery. We lay there about an hour while the 1st Marylander Regiment were sent into the woods in front of us where there was a steady roar of musketry, but they soon came out every man for himself. They had met the 1st Maryland Rebel Regiment, and after a hand-to-hand -hand fight, getting out of ammunition had to fall back. They got a new supply and went in again, and so had possession of the Rebel Works. We were then ordered to take their places, and with a yell, we dashed into the breastworks, which, well, shot and shell, cut the air all around us. July 4th, 1863, the battle was over by then. There was little firing in the morning, and about noon we heard the rebels had left. Our loss was eight killed and 40 wounded. About 3 p.m. we started in pursuit, went 10 miles and camped for the night. July 6th, 1863, we force marched 32 miles, got into camp at uh, about 11 o'clock. July 7th, 1863, my shoes gave way. I was barefooted. It rained. That was Gettysburg. It petered out. <coughs> Mr. President. A weekend that <clears throat> honors veterans of the United States. I am honored to be able to be part of this memorial here in Red Hook. When I left Washington on November 19th, 1863, it was the first time I had left the capital since the beginning of the Civil War to travel <coughs> to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania for this dedication of a memorial to the many who had served our country, many for the last time, <clears throat> at that battle in Gettysburg. After my speech dedicating the uh, battlefield dedicated memorial, I received a note from Edward Everett, <clears throat> who had delivered a two-hour oration at the dedication <clears throat> just before I spoke. And <clears throat> his note uh, <clears throat> praised me for what he described as an eloquent and concise speech, and what he said was, I should be glad if I could flatter myself that I came as near to the central idea of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes. I wrote back to tell him that I was glad to know that my speech wasn't a total failure. I'd like to now to take a couple minutes and to share with you what I said at Gettysburg at that dedication. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are men <coughs> on a great battlefield of that war, testing whether, now we're engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation 
or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We're met today on a great battlefield of that war. And we've come here to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives so that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate. We cannot consecrate. We cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or to try. <clears throat> the world will little note, nor will it long remember what we say here, but it will never forget what they did here. It is for us the living rather <clears throat> to be dedicated here to the unfinished work for which they who fought here uh, have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead that we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave their last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish on this earth. A sword, the Civil War Sword of the Historical Society Archives, it's dated 1865. And I have a little letter to read about a sword presentation that took place in Rhineland in 1863. At a meeting held Monday afternoon of last week at the Star Institute, the citizens of Rhinebreck presented a sword, sash, belt, and shoulder straps to Lieutenant Albert Procius of the 51st New York Volunteers as a token of their appreciation of his courage shown in six hard-fought battlefields and meritorious conduct during a service of two years. Lieutenant Procius was wounded at the Battle of Antietam and for his bravery gallantry, gallantry at the battles of Roanoke Island, New Bern, Bull Run, Chantilla, and South Mountain was promoted to lieutenant. On the scabbard was handsomely engraved by E. Stiles the following inscription, Lieutenant A. Procius from Friends in Rhinebeck, New York. Now, Lieutenant Procius received the gift, a sword from my fellow citizens. With a grateful heart, I pledge myself to use it faithfully for the good of my country. I try to do my duty, and he mentions the six sites of the battles. Wherever and wherever I may be sent, I shall, more be, I shall still more <coughs> devote it to the good cause. Thank you for your flattering kindness. The Glee Club sang their best several stirring and patriotic songs which received great applause. Lieutenant Procius left the following morning to rejoin his regiment, carrying with him the best wishes of his friends in Rhinebeck, signed Henry Delamater, President. The aftermath of Lincoln's assassination has told to us in the diary of an old man, right? Uh, Peter Funk, <coughs> who had gotten back in June of 1865 to Washington, D.C. for a few days where the whole army passed before the President, Andrew Dun Johnson at that point, and his cabinet and other high officials. But by then, the death of our martyr President Abraham Lincoln was reported but could not be believed. So later we were obliged to acknowledge it. The officers wore badges of mourning while the pallid cheek and sad low voices of men 
as if fearing to disturb the dead, were true signs of the love that the brave boys bore him. But Lee's surrender for a moment swept away the remembrance of the foul deed and all was wildest joy, yelling and tossing their caps in the air, turning somersaults, etc., and everything else that could be done to show their joyous feeling. After a few days of counseling, Joe Johnson refused to surrender and we were ordered to march again. Long story, long war, ending with Funk's return. We lay a few days in Washington, as I said, and <clears throat> we were finally put on the cars and sent humming on our way to Jersey City, for you'll recall that we had started by going to Jersey City, where we crossed over to, the New, York, to New York City and passed one night <coughs> uh, of horrors in the battery barracks, and there were led on board the Oregon, the same boat that had taken us away from home, and at 10 a.m. we arrived at Poughkeepsie. What my feelings or the feelings of the men in general were as once more we placed our feet on territory <coughs> in our native county and felt ourselves once more at home is not to be imagined or described. The street was crowded with our friends and joyfully took us <coughs> by the hand to welcome us home. After a heartfelt interchange of greetings, the crowd dispersed and we were disbanded to go where we would. Many went home that Saturday night, but I passed the days and the night in the soldiers' rest till Monday. After a splendid reception given by the ladies of Poughkeepsie, we, on the 8th of June, 1865, received our discharges and pay for citizens once more which position I am now filling as best I can. Peter W. Funk. And the last postscript of all to bring the story home again is the house divided, which we began with, and Civil War was meant to cure. Uh, this comes by way of family history from Sarah Hermans, who is a Losey. And she said that Dr. Ron Losey of Ennis, Minnesota, it was John E.'s great-grandson, to remember Dr. Losey, John Losey, and his brother Harvey, the rebel, said that Harvey, in a letter to his brother shortly after the war, expressed sorrow for embarrassing the family by taking part in the rebellion. John E. himself, another brother, Alexander, and sister Sarah Ann Losey, all named sons after Harvey. We are concluded. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> President, <laughs> Madam Secretary, <laughs> and oh, Thank you very much.